All right, people, welcome back. This is your last lecture for ecology. So, woo -woo. Um, so a little throwback. Last time we looked at change in populations. So like one species, how, the, how do those populations change? Exponential logistics. So like humans, um, you know, we've gone through exponential growth, especially in the Industrial Revolution, but, you know, all species will end up going into logistic growth eventually. And so that's what we're looking at. And you guys watched that video, like we probably won't ever reach 12 billion people. Um, you know, can, can the earth hold that many? Will people even have that many kids? So like we, we don't predict we'd have more than like 12 billion. So that's that's the idea. And right now we're, we're not quite at 8 billion. Um, so from last lecture, can you define carrying capacity? So go back, look at your notes. That would be a good definition to have written down somewhere. All right. So uh, instead of looking at populations this time, we're going to look at how communities will change. So communities would be all the different species in a set defined area. Um, so not just one species, but multiple species. And then just kind of uh, a little throwback, a little review. Ecosystem would be biotic, living, and abi abi abiotic things. Um, so we're just going to look at kind of communities, but they interact with their environment, right? So um, you can't really take a community out of its ecosystem. And then we'll look at some kind of overuse of limiting factors. All right, all right. So the big question is, do communities stay constant over time? So like thinking about it, uh, you know, thinking nature, like nature is always cyclical, right? Everything kind of goes through a cycle and recycles itself over and over again. You know, our environments have never stayed constant, but they've stayed like pretty constant. So communities do change over time, but they also will reach kind of like a peak state, right? Like a set area. So if we look at like Minnesota, we're kind of divided up in kind of a quote unquote set kind of boundaries where, you know, um, the northern areas, you got the coniferous forest, we've got deciduous, we've got prairie glass, a grassland, and then another type of grassland, the tall grass aspen. Um, those would be the kind of ecosystems, the communities you would expect in these areas based off like the soil, the rainfall, the temperature, you've got all these factors. Um, but, they weren't always like this, right? And, you know, humans come in and other things happen, like fires, you know, lightning storms, wind will come down and, like, knock trees down. And so these will all have to, like, regrow and kind of reset. So we have all this kind of constant motion, constant recycling in these areas. In Virginia, like, our um, community that's kind of, like, mature community is, like, a bunch of, like, hardwood trees. Um, so we might start off with, like, maple and pines with the softwood. Um, but eventually most of the forests there are, like, hardwood, um, which is... Is a little different than maybe um, coniferous forest. These would be more softwood. Here you guys have some hardwood trees down here. Um, so what we call this term, your, your kind of max, um, your, your top mature community is a climax community. It's like the steady state when you've reached the end of ecological succession. So we're going to get into this term succession coming up. Um, and it's usually only disrupted by like outside things. So like it could just be natural stuff like fires that I mentioned, tornadoes. Um, but you know, mostly it's been happening with like humans, right? We, we keep doing these things to areas. So an oak forest in Virginia, you know, the boreal forest up north or like a saguaro cacti desert in Arizona, like each, each different area, each different ecosystem would have its own kind of different unique climax community. So like what it would grow to and then kind of like stay at, kind of plateau at. Um, so here's the kind of cool Sonoran Desert. We usually do like a, a little activity with the Sonoran Desert because it's so awesome, but, um, Another time, another time. So what's really cool, especially for like creatures and all of us living around in these areas, is that as succession occurs, so succession would be like the gradual change in a community over time. So if you start off with just grass, kind of what would grow afterwards, and then this is the climax community here for like a hardwood uh, forest, um, <clears throat> is different species will live in different um, stages in, in the same habitat, right? So you have different types of birds and animals that live and, and bed down in like grass and like tall grass versus shrubs and seedlings versus, right, the younger trees versus pine uh, and maple um, and then versus like the hardwood. Um, so biodiversity is great because it gets us, you know, a vast diversity of life. It, it, it kind of promotes, it's like an indicator of a healthy ecosystem if you have lots of different species that can live there. Um, and then we as humans or other organisms can kind of take advantage of like the different benefits of kind of each stage, right, um, of, of uh, succession here. So moving on here. Um, what's unique is uh, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, we, we don't have many like wildfires anymore, right? So um, 
what has happened is communities tend to get to their climax community and then stay there. Well, what about like the, the organisms that need these kind of in between places, right? If, if those, if this habitat is going down, cause we're maybe not, you know, we're protecting maybe more wild, uh, um, you know, stands of trees. Um, some creatures are getting endangered. So like the Kirtland warbler is a big example of these, um, you know, it's, it's breeding ground up here. You know, a lot of people live up here, so we don't really necessarily want these trees and stuff to burn down. Um, and so they're, numbers are going way down because they're not being able to nest and breed. Um, so what do we do to help out is we've, we've tried to keep nature as you know natural as possible. So we'll do like control burns and stuff like that. So it disrupts the climax community, kind of resets everything, starts up the new growth. And then not only like the Kirtland warblers, but there's lots of other species that will take advantage of um, the new growth and that new area. So this is actually beneficial for lots of creatures, but birds, since they look so like pretty and beautiful, um, they're, they're kind of like the, the, the face of, um, conservation efforts. So pretty cool, right? So we mentioned succession. There's two major types. There's what is called primary succession and secondary succession. Primary, the kind of big difference is, all right, you're starting off on like just blank, brand new, a clean slate, a newly formed area. So like from a lava flow, from glaciers retreating, um, think about Hawaii when it popped up out of the ocean. So the first species that would have started living there, we call those the pioneer species, like kind of the, you know, uh, Great West, the Oregon Trail, right? The pioneers going out there. Secondary succession is what we see kind of more often now, um, especially with like humans um, disturbing environments. Um, this would be growth in existing communities that were only like kind of partially uh, destroyed. So like from a, a, a fire only destroys like part of a forest, well, there's still forests living all the way around it, right? Um, so these can actually replace themselves. Secondary su succession will actually occur a little bit faster because you have like the trees, maybe the hardwood trees around that can seed in the new area. Um, tornado those landslides, um, abandoned farms like farmland. You know, most of this you know area around here should be trees, um, but we've we've cut down a lot of things so we could plant. But if you abandon those farms, the trees are going to move back in, and it's going to go through succession. So here's our abandoned farmland here, right? Um, as the trees come back in, and you go from pine back to like a hardwood forest. Um, so this is secondary. Primary succession is like bare rock. So that's the big difference. Is it primary or secondary? Do you have other uh, uh, plants still hanging out around here? All right, so I've mentioned human impacts, and we, we talked about this stuff at the very beginning of the year, um, kind of with climate change, but we're going to talk about, you know, in the ecology unit, there's kind of room to talk about it a little bit more. Um, a big example of, like, human impacts on the environment and communities would be Easter Island. So it's this tiny little island way out here um, when... Uh, um, Explorers first got there, they basically saw these giants, um, they're called Moai giant statues. They saw no trees and like very few people, but they found fossil evidence like in the water and things like that of like boats that have been uh, uh, sunken. They've seen uh, evidence that there used to be a lot of people living there and there used to be evidence of trees, obviously, because where would the boats have come from. But none or few of that happened there now. So like what happened? on this island and they were very confused they're like all right well how did these moai get made and even move because these were like miles and miles away from here's the quarry like some of them were miles and miles away from where the actual quarry for the stone was so how did these people move them around so you guys are going to watch a video on that it's pretty interesting so once you watch it you will see um, that this is what we kind of guesstimate the population would have been so notice here's that exponential j-shaped growth but they like grew too high. They like kind of overshot um, their growth. So like, where do you think their carrying capacity maybe should have been? It probably should have been maybe around like 5,000, 6,000. That would have been sustainable, but they grew too much too fast. And then that caused their population to plummet because what they did is they cut down too many trees, um, not only for like boats and fishing, but you'll notice um, because of uh, kind of the Moai, it was the idea was to uh, build these Moai to like honor ancestors, but then the chiefs started doing it to like kind of honor themselves and it kind of got, yeah, a little a little funky that way. So um, that, that basically collapsed their, their island because it's an island, right? So, you know, with no being able to not uh, grow trees very quickly, they wouldn't be able to build boats very fast. So they won't be able to fish as much as they used to and they just couldn't support the size, um, this size of a population. So now it's kind of gone back up some. So maybe um, they, they've greatly reduced their carrying capacity there.
So we call this a tragedy of the commons when like, you know, a common resource gets overused or depleted or polluted and then not, not everyone can use it. Um, so it's not being used sustainably. So by sustainable, we, we mean it can be used like over and over again, generation after generation uh, without really destroying the habitat. So if, you know, an acre, you know, 40 acres of farmland, this is like the common resource. You know, how many cows can you put on there without actually destroying all the grassland so the grass can still regrow? and reseed itself you know 20 cows might be the carrying capacity but if you put more than 20 then they eat all the grass and then boom after one generation that's it you, you've lost the resource so this has actually happened a lot unfortunately so here's some unintended consequences so uh, sticking with agriculture you know how a farms usually laid out they're laid out in this kind of like you know square by square patch uh, patchwork pattern which is good for growing crops but what has it done to the forest right you basically you know cut a giant forest and these little slivers and different species will now take advantage of living in these different um so if you you know you see around our neighborhoods and stuff like cardinals mikey birds things like that we call those like fringe species they can they usually live on the fringe well now instead of having species of birds that and animals like deer and coyotes and stuff that like the interior of the forest there is no interior anymore right now these areas are like too small and like everything is fringe so we call that habitat fragmentation um, and this kind of idea of not having enough forest land is kind of what led to the dust bowl as well they didn't plant the right crops there wasn't cover crops that got down on you know wind would just blow in there wasn't any windbreakers and that is what caused the dust bowl so habitat fragmentation um, now now we're trying to set up farming so it's more sustainable and we can keep Keep more uh, species around a greater variety of species and try to use maybe more native crops like is it is it smart to be growing a certain crops where it's basically you know very arid and a desert and we don't have to overuse water so we'll talk about water in a little bit so this is my shout out to the Lorax so who speaks of the trees so another tragedy of the commons is deforestation and so this is pretty eye-opening right so this is all the forest that used to be in the US kind of right when the colonists 100 years ago come out so imagine you know being the native indigenous tribes and seeing your entire land your entire ecosystems basically right before your eyes, right? So this is, and you can kind of see the height of the industrial revolution. Look at, we've lost about like 90% of our forest land, which is crazy, right? Uh, and that takes a long time to grow back. So old growth is considered non-renewable just because it takes forever. And now we don't have even the space to, to do it as more, right? Because there's people living all over these places or farmland or whatnot. There's a lot going on. So we did forests, here's oceans, who's in control of the oceans? Ocean has been a huge problem. With better technology, we've been able to like catch more fish and more fish at once. Um, so up here, especially like kind of north, uh, east, um, these are all like kind of breeding grounds for fish. Um, and Atlantic cod used to be like a fish we would catch all the time, it'd be in the stores all the time. You can kind of see, maybe we were, it looks like we were doing pretty sustainable here. Um, maybe not though, because the population dropped, but then the our, our amount of catch went up because we got, you know, sonar fish, radar basically, where you can find all these fish. So in a few decades, right, these people were basically, the fishing industry was making like twice as much money, but then what happened? They fished all the fish out, and so this population shrank. So not only what is a carrying capacity for an environment, you know, what's what's like a sustainable amount of fish we should be catching all the time? And so basically this whole Atlantic cod industry just collapsed on itself, and now even years we're, we're struggling to get the cod back up to its normal levels before we outfished them. And we mentioned this, if I go back real quick, um, like the size of fish has actually shrunk based on like the size of our netting and stuff like that. So like the years of fishing we've done, we've actually fished out a lot of the larger fishes in the ocean. And now they've kind of gotten to be smaller, kind of like a artificial type of selection. Uh, I think I showed you guys this video um, at the beginning of the year. It's about those plastic oceans. But if not, feel free to check this out. It's optional. You know, so tragedy of the commons, overfishing, pollution. Uh, and then the big idea of like short term thinking. Yeah, it was great for profits, great for the industry. You know, everyone made a lot of money. But in the long term, it actually hurt tons of people. And you can kind of see this. We still think short term versus long term with a lot of decisions we're doing nowadays, especially like with climate change, um, with the EPA, right? We polluted this river, the Cuyahoga in Ohio, so bad that it lit on fire. Um, so uh, in 1969, so guess what? The Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act came out the next year. But, you know, businesses basically try and, you know, make as much money as they can quickly. And it's 
pretty much to the detriment in the long term to the businesses themselves, not only the environment, but to the businesses themselves. Um, you'll watch this video on the Colorado River, how that's going down. So I'll just leave you with this kind of uh, uh, aquifer, this overuse of groundwater. Notice this is the ground level in 1925. Um, this is the ground level in 1977. So check this out.